Greetings. Welcome, all from, everyone. Yeah, greetings from St. Louis and Illinois. Yeah, yeah Illinois. Um, and really, thank you all very much for taking time out to hear our discussion on current sterile compounding best practices. Um, just to give you a little background, uh, we started Life Scientific in 1992 to represent manufacturers of parenteral production machinery. And over the years, we've been involved in representing clean room and isolator manufacturers into the uh, parenteral production market. And in 2004, we handled a company that got us involved in the first USP 797 market. And we were handling their line of primary engineering controls. It was then shortly thereafter in 2005, we kind of decided we could build a better line of equipment and started aseptic enclosures. So aseptic enclosures is a division of for DBA of Life Scientific. Initially, aseptic uh, enclosures manufactured a basic line of CAIs and CACIs also known as compounding aseptic isolators and compounding aseptic containment isolators. Often we've been called upon to design and frequently build a pretty wide range of solutions for hospital pharmacy sterile compounding applications. So this slide shows a number of different types of designs and builds we've done in the past and really kind of based on our wide range of capabilities and being involved in many pharmacy compliance audits, we've also been called upon and have established a reasonably comprehensive on-site sterile training or sterile compounding training class. So um, we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. Uh, clearly we can't cover everything. There's a lot, and usually it's a, a multi-day format that we do on site, but hopefully we'll impart some good wisdom upon you guys. Um, Marco has a couple of housekeeping slides to cover with you, and then Mary Beth, one of our primary trainers and project engineer, will co uh, come on to cover a lot of the content. She gets involved directly in uh, going on site and executing some of these classes and doing the proctoring. So uh, thank you, Marco, for getting this set up and going. And maybe you can review some of your housekeeping. OK, so thank you, everybody, for connecting to the Zoom. As you can see, your microphone is muted. So the only way to interact with us, the speakers, to get your comments and questions in is through the chat. The chat is configured so you can message me directly so I can make sure that your question or comment gets through the speakers. If you have any question about the presentation, just post it as the presentation goes and we'll have a dedicated session for questions and answers at the very end of the presentation. You can find content from all of our previous webinars, including some other manufacturer-related presentations that are up there on our YouTube channel. You can find it at, on YouTube at Life Scientific Inc. So we're youtube.com slash Life Scientific Inc. We have a ton of valuable content up there. It might not be pharmacy relevant, but it, it's good. <laughs> might be interesting to see what your suppliers are doing in their plants occasionally, right? Exactly. Good morning, everybody. My name is Mary Beth. Hello to those of you that know me. I saw a couple of familiar names on there and um, greetings to those of you that don't. Hopefully we'll get to know you soon. The um, whole point of this webinar is so you guys can understand sterile compounding. There's been some changes to the USP, which we're going to discuss those key updates. We're going to review the sterile co uh, compounding best practices. 
the main reason today we're presenting this webinar is just to help you understand the importance of sterile compounding. We'll review sterile compounding best practices, the key updates, and we're also going to reiterate the importance of training your staff, which is something that we do that is required by the USP and that, um, you know, a lot of people just don't have time to do themselves, it, you know, a, a professional trainer to get in there and kind of take that burden off your hands is something that we offer. Yeah, and maybe working with the uh, designated person, so to speak. So um, a, a main thing that we um, talk about is the healthcare associated infections, otherwise known as HAIs. These reinforce the importance of training in sterile compounding. Without proper training and following the guide of the USP chapters, a staggering number of healthcare associated infections will occur. Uh, as you can see on the slide there, out of 100 admissions, seven to 15 patients will acquire an HAI. That's seven in more um, you know, urban areas and then in more remote areas, um, it goes up to, to 15. The, and actually one out of 10 in those cases will die. So by following the guidance of the USP during sterile compounding procedures, we can help reduce this number. Yeah, it's significant. And one thing too, is if you look at this, on, on, of the infections that are recorded, and this is WHO, it's global, it's not really restricted to the US, we had old information, old data about uh, U.S. deaths and whatnot, so we kind of updated this a little bit, but um, they're segmented out. 14% are bloodstream infections, but relative to uh, the number or the percentage, 31% of the overall deaths are from bloodstream infections and you know, interestingly enough, I just dealt with a couple of bloodstream infections my 90-year-old dad had, and he made it to the other side, but it was touch and go for a while. They can be really, really significant. So uh, how do healthcare associated infections spread. They spread any way they can, but mostly they're spread by contaminated human touch caused by insufficient hand washing or hygiene, improper PPE. Another source of spread is touching or laying supplies on contaminated surfaces. They also spread through airborne pathogens and indwelling medical devices such as catheters, feeding tubes, and wound drains. So it's just another thing that, you know, that the training is for. Your staff needs to be mindful of you know, what they do, everything they touch, what they touch afterwards, and, you know, things that like that will spread these infections. Yeah, but at least there is some good news. Um, you know, the same study that had those numbers establishes that a, a good infection prevention uh, control system being implemented in the healthcare facilities can have up to a 70% direct impact on uh, HAIs. So it is really possible to get in and um, clean up your act. So hopefully today we teach you a thing or two that can be useful to this cause. And one of the things that helps you clean up your act is following the general chapter 797 uh, for sterile compounding. This chapter pertains to compounding sterile preparations and describes the minimum standards that must be followed. Following the requirements of this chapter will help to minimize harm, including death to patients that could result from microbial contamination, excessive bacterial endotoxins. This chapter goes further into other factors that could cause harm, such as inappropriate quality or strength of ingredients that we're not really going to discuss today. Um, that's something we can get into later if we do some further training, but mostly today we're going to concentrate on um, sterile compounding and things you can do to make your room, you know, less harmful to the patients that you treat. One thing that is now required in the USP as a designated person, some people call them sterile compounding supervisor. Uh, they have many different names, but they also have a lot of different tasks. So some of these tasks involve, um, it's, it's something I want to touch on because it's a really important part of ensuring sterile compounding flow. This person has a quite a bit of responsibility to make sure that the staff completes all the required training. All compounding areas are at a minimum USP requirements, and they have to also develop all the SOPs. 
So there's things that um, we can help do as a guide for this person's qualifications, what they need to do, um, things they need to check off and things they'll have to follow through out the year when we're not there. And then also when we're there um, to help kind of guide them through the steps and the procedures of things that they have to follow. Yeah, there's a, a lot to take on. And it's really good to have somebody that's more or less assigned to be the sterile compounding area specialist. Um, they can review procedures and do a lot of different things that we'll be discussing throughout the remainder of these slides. But uh, I think this having a designated person with the responsibility, sometimes we're talking about a pharmacy of one, sorry, uh, you have a lot to handle. And this is a very, very broad subject in, you know, your suppliers, they have multiple departments that are dealing with uh, aseptic processing and here, you know, your department could be one or maybe two. But that's one of the things that perhaps somebody with a little more expertise can come in and do and help with. So we're going to be talking about a couple of the um, changes from the previous USP chapter to the um, revised chapter that's not, it's out now, but it's not in effect until November of 2023. But the old, um, the previous chapter discussed the different categories of the compounded sterile products. They define them as immediate use, low risk with 12 hour BUD, low risk level, medium risk level, and high risk level. These categories are based on pretty much how many manipulations and how many packages of products were used, as well as other factors such as exposure to worse than class five air determining the risk level. So higher risk means lower BUD um, any, because, you know, it higher risk means you know things are going to grow a lot faster so they can't sit on the shelf for a longer time the bud was anywhere from immediate use to 12 hours to a maximum of 48 hours at controlled room temperature obviously longer if it was refrigerated or um, in the freezer but a lot of problems with those categories were the high risk levels were a lot of times confused with hazardous risk csps yeah. which are definitely not the same Yep, we found that to be the case. And so going to C1, C2, C3 seems to make quite a bit of sense. So at first it seems a little confusing, but after you, you know, do the reviews and, and read through it, it does actually make a lot more sense because there is no confusion at this point with hazardous versus high risk. Um, you know, so the, the risk factor is, you know, how many microbes can get in there and how fast they can potentially grow. So again, it's the same thing, you know, higher risk, lower BUD, but they categorize them now as still immediate use, category one, category two, and category three, distinguished primarily based on the state of the environmental control under which they're compounded. The risk of microbial contamination determines the probability for microbial growth during the time that they'll be stored and that time period with which they'll be used. So the least controlled environment means lower BUD, all the way from immediate use, again, from 12 hour BUD up to a max of 90 days this time at controlled room temperature. Of course, there's a lot of you know, mitigating factors that get you up to 90 days at controlled room temperature, but that is a, a new category that they offer now. Yeah, and I think most of the people that are on today, most of our clients are in category one and category two. Predominantly category three is when you're doing some level of manipulation or additions of non-sterile product and then have to go through final uh, terminal sterilization one way or another, either through uh, a 0.2 micron filter, which sometimes bugs are smaller than 0.2 microns which is a little scary, but that's still an accepted practice. And then there are different sterilization um, options that are available. We'll show one or two of them, I think, probably later. Um, but yeah, so most of you are dealing with uh, immediate use, category one, category two. So um, the... Um, um 
two of the most important parts of understanding sterile compounding are the facility and engin engineering controls and making sure your personnel are properly trained in how to use them. So this re is a requirement of the USP chapters for sterile compounding. So that's where our staff training comes in. So for categories one and two, the staff must be trained and evaluated every six months now. Prior, it was um, annually. So every six months and every three months for category three. As you can see on the slides, aseptic enclosures, we have a table of contents there for clean room compliance training. We can help you navigate through all the um, processes and the requirements of you know, the, the new USP, things that are required, what you need to do, and that's something that we can offer and kind of walk you through that process. So this is one takeaway, and those that have worked with us in the past know I'm always kind of preaching this, but um, one mantra, I guess, for those that are working in sterile compounding facilities to keep in mind is that first air is your last defense. So first air is the um, unrestricted unidirectional airflow coming out of a HEPA filter. So here we've got a reasonable example of uh, first air from a HEPA. And here we've got a situation where there's turbulent airflow occurring. Um, those are reasonably significant differences and something good to keep in mind. Um, first air is the undistributed air coming directly out of the HEPA filter from your primary or secondary engineering control. And if there are other systematic breakdowns prior to you starting to do your compounding, uh, being respectful and aware of this mantra can really help rectify otherwise bad practices. So you know, think about where that first error is coming and how do you keep your product blanketed or protected in that first error, especially if you're working with uh, exposed critical sites can make a significant difference just knowing that you're keeping everything in that first error and you know, if you have something on your hand, you didn't do proper hand hygiene, you got a hitchhiker on a vial that wasn't disinfected totally on the way down, pay attention. First air is your last defense. And, you know, sometimes when you're in a clean room operation, it, it's hard to and the fluid dynamics of uh, air and looking at some of these modeling things that are occurring, computational fluid dynamics, it can be really hard to determine what exactly is turbulating flow. But one thing that you want to think about is like even an IV bar. Uh, we are going through and reducing the diameter of our IV bars on some primary engineering controls to reduce the amount of turbulence that is created as the air flows past that IV bar. Um, it, it can make a significant difference and certainly one practice that you want to respect uh, in addition to that first air is the last defense is just never really put your hands over any exposed critical sites as you're going through and doing your work. So also, one of the things I think we'll touch on in a little more detail is the person being in the process. Um, that is really a significant risk to the overall process and trying to do everything possible to eliminate people um, as much as you can from the critical work zones, your primary engineering controls, your ISO 5 environments, the ISO 7 clean room, you know, try to move out as much activity as is entirely possible. Um, and that way it really helps you keep it cleaner. So 
here is an example of some basic room layouts and the differential pressures, as will be again discussed, I guess, in a little bit more detail. Uh, typically, our training begins with uh, engineering controls evaluation that might start before we get on site to evaluate a floor plan and certification report and start to get a good idea of the physical area that you're working with. Um, a good layout of appropriate engineering controls can really help reduce the risk of unintentional contamination and it can do it in a pretty significant factor. Trying to gain an understanding of airflows and pressure differentials will help you understand what activities could potentially breach the aseptic quality of your operation. Um, sometimes there are ways to cheat the system a bit and implement perhaps uh, atypical solutions, which is what we're showing here. Um, this is a piece of equipment that combines a low wall return with a HEPA filtered supply. It can add up to 500 CFM of air changes per hour to a room. 500 CFM can be pretty significant. It's just a plug and play piece of equipment that attaches to the wall and remains below the ceiling. So it doesn't really help so much with unidirectional airflow unless you're standing directly under the filter, might be a great place to do garbing below one of these things. But you know, prior to our client realizing that this was a potential solution, they were looking at a seven figure upgrade of their HVAC system to rectify low flow to their ante rooms, which made them divert flow into the buffer rooms. And so their facility had to be all immediate use as a result until we got these things installed. So this was less than six, six figures to do four ante rooms. So anyway, sometimes there can be um, unusual approaches to make your situation a little bit more palatable. Um, here, the airflow, basic airflow, you have an ISO class five primary engineering control that's blowing out into the ISO class seven, which when the doors open, blows out into the ante room, ISO class eight. Um, normally, we just put ISO seven rooms in there anyway, ISO 8, uh, the difference in cost between making a room ISO 7 and ISO 8 is pretty insignificant. But anyway, um, an ISO 8, if it's only feeding a positive pressure uh, buffer room is adequate. And they have, they show here a clean side and a dirty side of the line of demarcation which is coming up a little bit more in discussion relative to the revised USP and um, sink placement. So the placement of the sink is discussed quite a bit now in USP and do you have a sink in the room or not? Um, different schools of thought there, but I am very happy that it has been addressed because we weren't really in significant agreement with putting the sink um, on the clean side of the line of demarcation because the sink is um, water and water is one of the leading sources of contamination um, in the clean room. Also, just a sidebar, before you had seen uh, the table of contents for our training class and when we were going through making up some slides and reviewing the USP revision, one of the things that we were 
looking at was just the basic organization. And we found that USP kind of bounces around a little bit. So we just tried to group our slides based on how we go into a uh, training program. So first we're doing, as I had mentioned before, the engineering controls review. So at the bottom, I've got a bit of a tongue in cheek statement here. The best clean room is one that is kept empty and that no one ever goes in. Um, it's really something good along the lines of first air is your last defense, but something, another mantra for the designated person to embark upon the people going in and working in those sterile facilities is that really you want to try to keep your buffer room, your primary engineering control as empty as possible, bringing in as few items as possible, keep the inventory and stock supplies that have to go in periodically to the buffer room, keep those in the ante room. Try to avoid as much storage in the buffer room as is possible. So, you know, it's the people and the stuff that risks your product sterility. Trying to minimize the overall impact is, of course, a design goal. Um, yeah, and newly added statements in the USP, which I also like a lot, um, is the discussion or a brief point about allowing two separate ante rooms. So a dirty ante room and a clean ante room. And I'll tell you, personally, in the past, we've dealt with situations where uh, auditors couldn't necessarily understand why our design had two ante rooms. You know, it wasn't written anywhere in the USP. And if it's not written there, uh, well, they can't uh, necessarily interpret uh, those that aren't spelled out in black and white. But now in the USP, there is discussion about the allowance of two ante rooms specifically. So that's great. And it can make a lot of difference, especially in a negative pressure environment where the initial ante room can be positive pressure and blow into the negative pressure ante room of the area. So just to give you an idea, this is a couple of different designs. This is a traditional pharmacy planning and design job we did of one facility where the hazardous side is completely isolated from the non-hazardous side, which is great because um, sometimes there are complaints about people walking from the hazardous, going through the ante room, and then going into the non-hazardous and not uh, microbially contaminating the area, but they are bringing, you know, schlepping hazardous materials back and forth. So the separation is good. Um, short of that, and this is a trailer designed for a trailer, our standard product design where you walk in, you're in an office area, and then go into the clean room. So we have the sink set up on the clean side of the line of demarcation. This is a positive pressure ante room with a pass through for bringing hazardous materials in to the second ante room, which is negative pressure. So when the door is open here, air comes in from this ante room, goes into this ante room. But the important difference on something like this, having a second ante room, is that the ante room can be more negative than the buffer room. So they're both hazardous. Your hazardous material storage goes in a negative pressure room. And if you make it a little slightly more negative than the buffer room, guess what? Air moves from the buffer room into the ante room and is contained in that negative pressure zone. And I'm pretty sure that most of you know, doing some level of microbial testing, that your chemo buffer room is the hardest one to maintain the cleanliness of. So we're liking that second um, anti-room design quite a bit. 
So um, there is better description, more detailed information relating to room design in the USP revision. It's spelled out a lot clearer. So it is a much better read than the 2008 version. Um, perhaps now there's even a little design leeway for some facilities. One thing in particular was uh, the use of caulking in the floor to wall junctions, um, as opposed to strictly specifying coving, which has its share of problems that um, can occur. So generally, uh, engineering controls to generate the best unidirectional airflow as possible, and you want a facility that's as easy to clean as possible. And I'm sure many of you are trying to figure out ways to upgrade your facilities to get more than a 12-hour BUD. It can be a complicated scenario, but I just wanted to show you one possible solution is this type of unit that we designed and built for Abbey to go in their warehouse. It's a sampling booth that was specified to run at ISO 8. It runs at ISO 7 and it's placed in an existing room. So if your area perhaps can, you have high enough ceilings or can accommodate a low ceiling in your compounding area, something like this without construction permits, you know, it's just a piece of equipment, something like this might be able to drop in to an existing area using your existing HVAC and wind up providing you with a solution that is, well, a lot less expensive to implement. So this is a range of primary engineering controls that can be implemented. Uh, we design and build a variety of different types of hoods, and back in the day, handling isolators for manufacturers, my early experiences were with the LUMS group, and the LUMS group st stood for Lily, Upjohn, Merck, and Searle, I guess. <laughs> there are some of you that might not even know who Upjohn and Searle is. But anyway, that group was a cooperative group of engineers from those manufacturing plants working together to figure out ways to remove people from the process and implement isolators around their manufacturing. Um, and, you know, over and over and over again, we always hear that it's the person that contaminates the process. So how do you eliminate the person from the process? I'm still, even though there have been some pretty significant changes about uh, the compliance of isolators, uh, a pretty big fan. And I think my slides got a little bit out of order, but before I went on to discuss one of these pieces of equipment, I wanted you to see this statement from the introduction of the USP revision. So take a moment, I just snipped it out. So for those bold enough to give it a go, if you can establish that your method is better than what's stated in the USP and validate it, um, it should be totally compliant. And just, uh, you know, if you think about the ante room and the cleaning and disinfection process, what we did with this unit was remove the person from that disinfection. So you move product in, spray it, wipe it down, and um, arguably it's better than somebody walking into a clean room. And yeah, <laughs> but uh, certainly we understand that um, it can be difficult. And based on the climate of your state and the inspector coming in, uh, how much argument are you willing to make? So currently 
isolators have to be in a clean room configuration just like a hood or just like a hood the 12 hour BUD uh, immediate use and cat one applies. So regarding certification, you're all familiar with the process, but one of the things in certification that I think is good in the bit of a revision in the USP is the designated person and trying to get the designated person to watch what's occurring during the certification for their own edification and also just to kind of make sure that they're doing everything they're supposed to be doing. And one edition in USP discusses uh, smoke studies. It's a very good practice, and we've been doing it on our equipment. Uh, a lot of times we'll run computer modeling of the fluid dynamics, but um, that's usually done before a piece of equipment is built. After it's built and in place, knowing where you're getting good unidirectional airflow and where you're not is of great value. So that designated person as possible really ought to be involved in witnessing uh, the certification occurring every six months. Oh, Wake my up, turn Mary again. Beth. All right. I know you need to take a break, don't you? Um, <laughs> so this is part of like, you know, entering the clean room has certain things that obviously have to be done before you do that, such as you know, washing your hands and taking off coats and, you know, changing your shoes, anything from outside the clean room can't go in, anything inside can't go out, remove any jackets, remove jewelry, different things like that. So a good thing to be mindful of is all these procedures you have to do. And that keeps you from, um, you know, contaminating your clean room. So having a, we can help provide you with these posters that we have here the different procedures, that's something that you can put into your SOP, your designated person um, can put on there, and then we can laminate those. One can be hung outside the clean room before you even enter. Another one, um, the next slide, Mike's going to go to it, that actually talks about the next procedures for the actual gowning procedures and the actual steps that you need to do. That can be another thing that's laminated so it's cleanable hung inside the ante room and walk through those steps because um, you know people that are used to doing this every day, they get compliant and then sometimes they just uh, don't, you know, they, they skip a step. So if it's right there in front of them every day, they, you know, if it's somebody that's new, that's not used to doing it, you know, have something there in front of them, make sure that before they enter the clean room, they do those procedures properly. Again, that's something that we train them to do on, but we're only there, you know, twice a year. And then after that, you guys are kind of on your own. So that's something you need to be mindful of. Yeah, this Mary Beth is... touched on a, a very, very good topic. And, you know, we've seen it quite a bit in doing our trainings that uh, it's really the rookies, the new people, the interns that might get involved in doing sterile compounding that have the best aseptic practices. So keep that in mind, you know, you get um, a little lax uh, about really paying attention to appropriate process and procedure. Right. And it's nothing against the, you know, tried and true, you know, people that have been there because, but I, but I see this because I do this and I train these people and they're just, it's such a, um, you know, muscle memory that they're doing it that they, they do it fast and they, you know, don't even realize when they're doing stuff. That's why I'm there and I watch them do it. And, you know, if I catch them doing it, I'm like, you know, slow down or do this or whatever. And it's, it's always a shocker to the people that have been there that are the seasoned, you know, pharmacists that end up failing on a glove fingertip test or failing on a media test because they do it every single day and they don't even realize what they did wrong. Whereas the new people, the technicians, you know, I walk them through that and they are asking me constantly, you know, okay, what's next? What do I do? Did I do that right? And they're very mindful of it. And, you know, that they're very good. And, and a lot of times, like it's, sh it's shocking that a guy that's been there for 20 years will fail. And, and, and a new person that's been there for, you know, hasn't even compounded yet 
you know, will pass, but it is because they're very mindful. So reiterating this, that's why we're doing this. You know, we were doing it annually. That's why we're doing it every six months now is it, it, it everybody needs to be, you know, reminded of it. Another thing that um, this slide talks about is the wipe down process. So I call this staging. And it's something that a lot of people, they, they don't even realize that it has a name in there, what they do, but it, it's something that needs to be done and it needs to be done twice. So it's called a double wipe down. So before you bring any, um, you know, like was Mike was saying, if you go into the buffer room, nothing needs to be stored in there. Nothing needs to be in there. So before you go into the ante room, you're going to wipe everything down. Only what you need to take with you into that particular compounding session it shouldn't be stored in there. So you figure out what you're going to need. You put it on a staging cart, you wipe it down and be before it goes into the ante room, and then you've got everything you need. And then again, as you go into the buffer room, before you put it into the PEC, you wipe it down again, that that's that double wipe down. And it's also that practice of making sure you have everything. So you're not walking in and out of the room because a lot of people, they walk out of that room and they forget one thing and they don't want to, you know, ungarb and regarb to go get it. And then that's a, a big source of contamination there again that they kind of forget about. Um, so this slide is a talking about cleaning a clean room. So a clean room has to be properly cleaned and it has to be cleaned by appropriate people who are trained in how to clean that clean room. Um, back in the day, people would just let their janitorial staff come in there. They weren't trained. And then the clean room is dirtier when the janitorial staff left <laughs> than when they come in there. So now a lot of times, you know, a trained person, not a janitorial staff, usually a compounding person is a designated person for cleaning either the clean room or inside the PEC. So we train people in how to properly clean the clean room and um, walk through the steps of it. So this slide talks about the cleaning frequencies of it. The frequencies haven't really changed, but one thing that's changed a lot is that the cleaners themselves now have to be sterile, not just the isopropyl alcohol, the actual cleaners. And then the um, it adds a lot more, like things that weren't on the schedule before were, you know, the doors and door frames, the bins on the shelves. I mean, shelves that, you know, you figure if there's a bin on there, you could clean it, but it just said storage shelves before, and now it says storage shelves and the bins on the storage shelves and the frequency of how they have to be cleaned. So it's a lot more, um, there's no gray area as much in this USP. So it, it's a lot more defined in how you clean it. Oh, isn't this slide fun? <laughs> um, it, yeah, so seriously, this slide is something that a lot of people, again, aren't mindful of that you know we need to talk about and the designated person needs to be aware of. If you are sick, but you don't really think you're sick, oh, it's just a little cough, runny nose, you know, a little bit of fever, whatever, that's going to make you shed a lot of extra microbes while you're in the clean room, while you're compounding. And again, if you're sick or if you've got a tattoo, pink eye, you got a rash, you are going to shed a lot more particles mm -hmm. than you normally would, even if you're fully garbed. Those particles are going to be laden with microorganisms. Again, you see that dirty mask there that, you know, either somebody was coughing and they had makeup on. If you wear makeup, it different was things, makeup. you're, you're <laughs> going to be shedding a lot more additional, you know, microbes than you normally would. And you can see that by proof there on the mask. I mean, you know, that should be clean. So be mindful of that. If you have any of those conditions, do not compound until you talk to your designated person to see whether you're allowed to or not. Yeah, I think there's, uh, we have too many slides. There's a lot of content to cover, but anyway. We um, ran out of time. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll move along quickly and try to bang through this stuff. But uh, one of the things that's discussed now a lot more, and we were involved on a steering committee for the microbiological side of things, and um, it is really important to have a good understanding of what's going on with the cleanliness of your uh, clean room. And this is how you can get to the bottom of different situations. So although you don't necessarily have to have when you're doing plating of surfaces and fingertips, it's not always mandated that you have those um, things that may grow on the plate speciated. It, often can make a lot of sense to have it done so you know what kind of corrective action plan you might want to implement. It's, uh, it's really important. So, and you can, 
you know, generally stuff from the outside winds up falling into certain categories, things from water or certain bug types, things from your air handling system or generally a group of different bug types. So if you go out and find out what those bugs are, have them speciated, then you can address what the issue might be. So we can bang through these next slides pretty fast, basically talking about personnel training and evaluation, um, the different types of things that have to be done required by the USP, garbing and competency gowning and garbage and garbing and gowning competency evaluation. Again, this is something we do with your staff training. Before it was done annually. Now for categories one and two, it's every six months. For category three, it's every three months. And this is um, something that just guys to show. Look at your hand washing before and after soap. Even after soap, you have you know a lot of um, you know colonies forming on that plate there. So the um, you know uh, sterile gloves. That's the very last thing you need to do. Again, a lot of people don't remember that once they are out of the package, they're not sterile anymore. So that's why as soon as you do that, um, you have to do your plating and it initially you have to do it three times and pass it in a row before you can compound. So that's one thing that a lot of people always, well, not always, but fail uh, continuously is to just realize as soon as I get that glove, it's sterile, but it's not. As soon as it comes out of the package, it's not anything you touch, it can be contaminated. So that's one thing we uh, really reiterate when we train a lot for that. Definitely Next. can. And typically when you're in an isolator, uh, you've got three gloves on. Okay. So you have the liner before you go into the glove that's attached to the sleeve, which is called the gauntlet glove. And then you're putting the sterile glove on over the gauntlet glove. So a uh, little bit um, of <laughs> it's a challenge of dexterity, I would say. But there is a proper way to put on a glove. And, uh, and, you know, a lot of people don't do that. And that's one thing that I, you know, really reiterate in my training is the proper way to put it on. And, uh, you know, that's, again, a lot of the new technicians, they really ask me and have me walk them through it so they do know the proper way. It's not just, you know, opening the package and, and throwing those gloves on. I mean, you want to keep them as sterile as you can. Same thing with the, um, the aseptic manipulation. So that's changed again. Also, that was, uh, that was a year and now it's every three months. Um, except for, for category, every six months for category one and two, every three months for category three. So we go through the whole media fill process inside your, you know, most dynamic condition, which is usually inside your hood, inside your clean room or inside the isolator. We go through the media fill testing, the whole procedure of that. And then the new this year afterwards is adding that gloved fingertip sample afterwards. So glove fingertip sample has to be done twice. That has to be done. And after the garbing, um, the fingertip test, initially three times in a row, pass it. And then again, it has to be done after the media fill test. And then those have to be evaluated. They have to be incubated. And then it's either you know a, a pass fail depending on how many colonies are on the plate. Environmental air sampling, um, this is, not new, but it, they do have different frequencies on it this year. It used to be just every six months when you're usually when your certifier was there, it was something that he did. Now for class three, it has to be done at least monthly. Um, so we do have viable air samplers. A lot of people just let their certifier do that, but you can purchase one on your own and take care of that sampling on your own and then get it tested and then follow the colonies on that. Same thing with surface sampling. This is a lot easier to do than the air sampling but they have new regulation on that now also that the surface sample of the direct compounding area must be taken immediately after the media field done for aseptic manipulation test. That's new for this year. So that's a, another added plate that we're gonna have. Um, but it, all the classified areas have to be sampled such as um, the inside the PEC, any surfaces that are frequently touched, um, you know, pass throughs, things like that. So at least monthly now that's going to have to be done. Those samples will have to be then sent and incubated. That's something that, uh, again, we have the incubator there at our office right there. Mike's talking about that. Yep. The um, samples of what we do, how we test those and the. Um... Yeah, we do have a small yeah. lab on site and do uh, sample incubation for a number of clients. So we get uh, experience in seeing what's going on with these facilities and 
club fingertips often are uh, failures. And if they happen frequently, well, then we're getting called on to try to help them troubleshoot and come up with a good corrective action plan. And so some of the documentation that your designated person may be responsible for putting together, that's certainly something that we should be able to help with if necessary. Um, I think, what did they say, GMP, good manufacturing practices, or uh, generate more paper. But <laughs> there is quite a bit of paper associated with the process um, that we have on hand and might be able to help with. Speaking of more paperwork, this is something that um, needs to be done and the records have to be kept in the um, person compounding in their file. They'll have a file with all this paperwork in it. Um, competency assessments. This is something that is a checklist of everything that the USP requires that that compounding person do and pass and have knowledge of or needs to be remediated. This is the um, written test, which is also required. These things will be done, filled out. Um, we give these as part of the training evaluation, and then you keep this record in their compounding file. When you're all done and you're passed, and if there's any failures, they have to be redone also before the certificate is handed out. But at the end of our training, after you've passed all the competencies, then you get a certificate with your name on it for your file that shows that you are good to compound. So uh, before I'd mentioned, you know, a few different sterilization technologies, we are working with companies on the manufacturing side that do that, but that's for the C3 product. I don't really think it's appropriate largely for this audience, but, um, and we don't deal a lot with this end. So up to this point, you know, through slide 42 is where our uh, wheelhouse is. Once we get into master formulation and looking at the records, we do that, but providing any real good advice on uh, formulation processes and things like that isn't yet in <laughs> uh, our scope. So um, also the sterility and bacterial endotoxin testing of the product is something that we don't do in-house, but can help facilitate. So if you do wind up needing sterility tests on the product and don't have a resource, let us know. We'll be glad to help and um, get that worked out for you. So really, I think, okay, well, we made up a few, a uh, little bit of time there. And Marco, do we have any questions to cover? Yeah, we have one that we can cover right away. Uh, can you clarify on glove fingertip sampling? Glove fingertips is done three times for new compounding stuff and is completed directly following the garbing process. And another glove fingertip is conducted past media fill for a new compounding stuff. Is the glove fingertip post garbing done again through the year? Is it done annually, biannually for existing, not new compounding team members? So in the uh, previous chapter, yes, everything you said is correct. In the previous chapter, it was done annually. That is something that is now required to be done semi-annually for categories one and two. So an initial person will do the fingertip test three times in a row and pass it after the garbing. They'll do the complete garbing, gloving, fingertip sampling three times in a row. They will pass that and then um, they will do the media fill testing and then do the fingertip sampling after the media fill testing just once. That's all initial testing. And then once they pass all that, then the following, you know, six months later, they'll do just one fingertip test after the garbing and one fingertip test after the media fill. And that will now be done semi-annually for category one and two. So just to clarify, uh, you garb, you fingertip test, you um, de-garb, uh, you garb again, you fingertip test. So you do that three times in a row. So you're taking everything off, putting a fresh set back on and fingertip testing again. Correct. Just, yeah. Okay. Anything else, Marco? Yeah, uh, let me scroll back. 
Um, are the staff that are currently competent required to repeat initial GFT at times three uh, with new incubation temperatures? No, that's only for initial staff. If they've already passed that three times once, um, even though this is a revised chapter, they're still considered, um, you know, veteran staff, and they do they only have to do it once for the next um, compliance. Okay, moving on to the next one. Uh, please demonstrate how to introduce items received in sealed containers designed to keep them sterile until opening into primary engineering controls without the need to wipe the individual sterile supply items with sterile 70% IPA. I so we can demonstrate. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's a little bit gray, but what you want to try to do is uh, wipe down the exterior surface as you know the the wipe down process is uh, as it's coming into the clean room and then as it's going into the primary engineering control and depending on the configuration of the item inside of that possible double bag um, you do a surface prep of the outside of the bag and then squirt the inner bag into the primary engineering control because that is sterile. And that way you avoid... They're tomorrow you know, afternoon. Keith Shell Hayes and Richard Furst. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> you got somebody yeah, else entering somebody. on. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the inside is sterile. And if it does work out, then squirting it into your primary engineering control after the outside surfaces have been really good um, and well disinfected is the good way to go about it. Because the reason they kind of do that is obviously that outer bag will shed some particulate, um, you know, depending on the, the makeup of the bag. So that's kind of, if it's inside sterile, like Mike said, kind of opening it in that you know, if it's a positive pressure opening kind of in that first air and letting that particulate go out and kind of squirting the inside sterile inside, that's kind of the, the thought process behind that is if you're keeping that particulate outside of your PEC. Applicable for double bag situations, but say for instance, you got a syringe that you're bringing in, you wanna disinfect the heck out of the outside surface and bring the blister with the syringe in it inside because you don't want to open the syringe up outside of the primary engineering control, the ISO class five zone, because then you're exposed in a critical site. Um, so there are those trade-off considerations that should be addressed procedurally. And perhaps the designated person, um, sterile compounding specialist perhaps is better, you know, designated person is kind of blasé. So anyway, yeah, yeah that's my a, recommendation is sterile compounding specialist. We have a follow-up on the same question. Would the package be open at the edge of the primary engineering controls or six inches into the primary engineering control? If at the edge of the PEC, how to make sure not to drop an item on the floor or contaminate sterile item? If I think, yeah, as mentioned, moving it in just a little bit so that you can uh, have some penetration and not run the risk of dropping it on the floor is good. And then just do a follow up disinfection of the surface that you just uh, brought into the primary engineering control. We have okay. a question. Uh, do we provide support for the designated person? Sure. And yeah. We have a couple of designated people that are online that were um, established early. And, you know, we learn from them while executing training in the past and have seen that facilities that have the designated person on board run better. They're cleaner operations. And for all of you that have questions about our training, training fees, and training packages, we'll reach out to you after the webinar, of course. And for all of the other product relevant questions, we'll, all, we'll also reach out to you right after the webinar. 
yeah um just get in touch and we'll try to deal with those offline thank you very much we really appreciate the interest and um hopefully we are helping you keep it just a little bit cleaner so right that was one thing we really didn't touch on i mean we touched about all the training but we do also um and can supply the uh, materials as well as the plates and the gloves and you know everything that you need to go along with your training as well. So if you have any questions on that, please let us know. Yeah, we're not a huge company, but our scope of supply is broader than just about anybody else in the market. So um, that's helped us learn. Anyway, thank you all so much. Good luck with it. And we're glad to help any way we can. Thank you really so much for your time. Yeah, really appreciate the time. Have a great afternoon. We thank hope you. to talk to many of you soon. Thanks.